So I'm going to um, kick this uh, second Stony Point Road Bicycle and Pedestrian Improvements Community Meeting off tonight. And I want to welcome um, those that were in attendance um, virtually in November and, and welcome back. And for those of you who are new um, to this uh, meeting conversation for Stony Point Road, I uh, would like to welcome you um, initially. So I am Nancy Adams, the transportation planner for the city of Santa Rosa. And I work in the transportation and public works department, specifically in the traffic engineering team. And I wanted to just give you a couple of quick, quick reminders. Um, we're, we'll be having interpretation services tonight, and that uh, service will be provided by Kim Tellis. Uh, she works with W Trans, and she will um, explain to you about the interpretation on um, that it can be heard on a Sp uh, Spanish channel and that you can join that uh, channel. So she'll explain that to you. And I'm gonna ask uh, Steve Brown, who is with the city of Santa Rosa. He's our, our host this evening. And Kim uh, with Debbie Trans to uh, explain how the meeting will work tonight. So Steve and Kim, could you take us on that conversation? Thanks. So, bienvenidos y gracias por acompañarnos en esta reunión sobre el proyecto de mejoramiento para ciclistas y peatones en Stony Point Road. Ella es Nancy Adams, la planificadora de transporte de la ciudad de Santa Rosa. Yo soy Kimberly Telles de la compañía W Trans y seré la traductora para la reunión de esta noche. Se puede escuchar la presentación en español en el canal de español de Zoom. Puede unirse al canal haciendo clic en el globo que aparece en su pantalla. Okay, very good. Um, I'm Steve Brown and thank you, Kim. Uh, as members of the public, as members of the public join the meeting, uh, you'll be participating as an attendee. Your microphone and camera will be muted. Only today's panelists will be viewed during the meeting. If you're calling in from a telephone and choose to speak during the public question and answer portion of today's meeting, for privacy concerns as host, I will be renaming your viewable phone number uh, to resident with the last four digits of your phone number. Please know the city of Santa Rosa is committed to creating a safe and inclusive environment free from disruption. We will not tolerate any hateful speech or actions and will monitor that everyone is participating respectfully or they will be removed. If necessary, we will also immediately end the meeting. As Zoom host, I will be lowering all raised hands until the question and answer portion of the meeting is open. At the end of the presentation, Nancy Adams will open up the meeting for public questions and comment. Once Nancy has called for public questions or comments, I will announce for the public to raise their hand if they wish to ask a question or comment related to this presentation. If you're calling in to listen to the meeting by telephone, you can dial star nine to raise your hand. I will then call on the public one by one who have their Zoom hands raised. Once you have raised your hand and asked your question or shared your input, I will lower your hand and mute your microphone so our panelists may respond to your question. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for, for that. Um overview for the, for the meeting this evening. So um, there, I think Steve's put up a slide that um, looks at what we hope to accomplish tonight. Um, so I'll begin with um, looking at the introductions for this evening's meeting. And we will have um, Steve Weinberger, who is with uh, W Trans, and he will be presenting uh, the uh, presentation along with uh, Barry Bergman. Um, so those two um, team members from Debbie Trans will be doing the, the uh, presentation that you'll see this evening. And from the city of Santa Rosa, we have um, Rob Sprinkle. He's the deputy director also in transportation and public works. And he um, uh, as, as well is in the traffic engineering team. So um, 
Barry and Steve, they're going to be um, a little bit about what they're going to be talking about tonight. They're going to um, be looking at um, some of the uh, design options that were um, presented back in November. And um, the, what they've done is they've taken um, the input that they received from the online survey from the community meeting in November and um, the bicycle, city's bicycle and pedestrian advisory board meetings and taking all that feedback that they've received. And um, what you'll see tonight is a little bit of a, a modification based on the feedback that they've received. So um, as Steve Brown mentioned, um, I will uh, be working with him once Steve Weinberger and Barry finish their presentation um, to to coordinate um, the question and answer period. And then um, the last person that you have already met is Kim uh, Tellis. She's uh, also with W Trans and she'll be doing our, our uh, Spanish translation um, throughout, the, the, throughout the meeting. So I'm gonna stop there because I think um, you're all more interested in seeing um, what, what the design team has come up with in terms of uh, refined options. So I'm gonna, Hand the the uh, part of this part of the uh, meeting over to uh, Steve Weinberger and Barry Bergman from Bear, uh, W Trans. So thank you. Okay, Barry, why don't you go ahead and get started, and then I'll be doing the second half of the presentation. Barry, on you're on mute. There we go. <laughs> Uh, Steve Brown, next slide, please. Uh, well, thanks everyone for coming coming out tonight. I'm sure some of you were probably at the first meeting. Um, we're just going to follow up on that and we've got some revisions to the designs that were presented. We listened to um, comments that were provided at the last meeting as well as discussions with staff. And um, We'd uh, like to get your feedback on what we've done to date and, um, and we can move, move forward on the project. This is the study area. Um, you see the green line going from left to right is Stony Point Road. The map has kind of an unusual orientation. You'll see the north arrow at the left. So, um, and then the, the parallel roads going from the top to bottom was Highway 12 through the middle. And then at the left of the screen is West 3rd Street, the Joe Rodota Trail in the center and then Sebastopol Road at the right. Next slide, please. So this is a study corridor. We've broken it down into three different segments based on the characteristics of that. So uh, one is between West 3rd Street and the bridge over Highway 12. And then um, over Highway 12, it, it is a bit more constrained. Um, and, then, and then south of Highway 12, between the Joe Rodota Trail and Sebastopol Road is, is the third segment. Next slide, please. So I'm um, just going to touch on a little bit of background. I'm going to try to go through this pretty briefly so we can focus on the design issues. Um, the reason that this project was undertaken, it was identified as one of eight corridor studies in the city's bicycle pedestrian master plan update and was also named by the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Board from the city uh, because of the high rate of severe bicycle and pedestrian injury collisions. So this is this is one of the ones that the city has identified to move forward on. It's also um, a major north-south access route for what's designated as a regional community of concern, which accounts for things like low income and minority populations, and it's something designated by the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. So it's often often helps to get some funding when you can show community of concern benefits. Next slide, please. So some of the issues that we've been looking at all along, um, one was separation between bike lanes and vehicle traffic. There are currently bike lanes on Stony Point Road, but, but they're not the, that comfortable for people who are not, who are not um, maybe that familiar with riding in traffic or not comfortable. We want to shorten the pedestrian crossing distances, uh, make it easier for pedestrians to get across Stony Point Road and the cross streets reduce the speed of turning vehicles at intersections and at the, um, at the ramps for Highway 12, and then address vehicle bicycle conflict points. So we'll get into this a little bit more detail. Next slide, please. Uh, so we have been doing some outreach throughout this process. This is the second of two community meetings, um, of course, virtual. Unfortunately, we can't be meeting in person. 
we did an online survey around the time of the first meeting and got some input. And so that was really critical into helping us to tweak the designs. Um, we will be putting up, there's another survey that has just gone live and there should be a link set up from the city's website. So we're hoping to get more input on this. And, and so if you know people who have not been able to participate tonight, um, if you could forward that link around, then we'll be able to get some more input from, from other folks. Um, social media is another way that the word has gotten out around about the project. And there have been two meetings so far with the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Board with a third meeting coming up later this month. Next slide, please. So just a few of the key issues that were identified as, as uh, part of the last meeting. Um, the first two items are related to the Joe Redota Trail. There were a lot of trail users. One point that a number of people mentioned was to have an improved connection from the Joe Redota Trail to the Cesar Chavez School on Sebastopol Road. So that's something that's not really a good connection right there now. And um, uh, Sebastopol Road is a way to get there, but it's not a comfortable place to ride, especially for children. Also to reduce the potential conflicts between the Dora Dota trail users and vehicles turning right from the eastbound off ramp from Highway 12 onto Stony Point Road. So for people on the trail trying to cross Stony Point Road. Next provide bicyclists with additional protection from right turning drivers at intersections and driveways and Steve's going to illustrate some of that with at some of the locations. And then also one of the things that's um, proposed is to have buffered bike lanes to have additional space between vehicles and bicycles. And a number of people had requested that some kind of a vertical barrier be installed there to, to go above and beyond what just the striping would do. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned before that we had done a survey. We had gotten over 200 responses. And the kinds of questions that were asked included the travel purpose, whether they for recreation or, or shopping or work, um, some of the pedestrian safety concerns and, and um, at the different study intersections, what kinds of treatments people preferred or did not, uh, not approve of, um, bicycle safety concerns and comfort at the intersections, and then preferred design treatments. Next slide, please. So this is a um, question regarding the preferred bicycle design treatments. Uh, this just highlighted the, um, the top choices. So we asked people to rank them on a score of one to five, with one being the most comfortable, five the least comfortable. And these were the ones that were selected, um, but that were given a one or a two. And you can see all of these got over 50%. Um, the highest ranked ones, buffered bike lanes, got 70%. And the protected intersection, which you'll see an example of, got 68%. Next slide, please. Um, so just a few of the changes that have been made since the last time, if you were part of that November meeting. Um, and when, when Steve walks you through the, the details, you get to see exactly what, what this is about. But at the Highway 12 on-ramp, so that, that's on the bridge over Highway 12, um, there was concern about, about cars going too fast crossing the pedestrian crosswalks. So we talked about having a raised crosswalk there or possibly flashing beacons. Um, at the eastbound ramps, at, as, which is at the Joe, Joe Redota Trail Crossing, to eliminate one of the lanes on the off-ramp approaching Stony Point Road. Um, and that would allow for the construction of a curb extension, which shortens the crossing distance of the crosswalk across that off-ramp. And also a prohibition against right turn on reds onto Stony Point Road, because that, that is where vehicles have to cross the trail, so to, wait to protect trail users. At the Stony Point Occidental intersection, um, and this is written correctly, it should be a curb extension on the northeast corner. Um, it's a little tricky when you look at the maps because it is left to right is, is north south. So, um, so you'll see that on the upper left of your screen, we get to that point. Um, next slide, please. So now I'm going to turn it over to, to Steve Weinberger, and he's going to go through the details of the plan. Thanks, Barry, and uh, thanks for everybody attending. Uh, we do have some additional uh, details that weren't in the plan last time uh, that you were on. So hopefully this uh, will be good. We do have a couple uh, 3D images to show you as well uh, on the plan. So uh, as we've, this is the, uh, the current concept plan for the corridor and I'm gonna walk you through it. First thing I wanna point out, uh, next slide. Uh, the city staff has, uh, 
met with police and fire and with our maintenance crews to select a raised device to put in the buffered area um, up between the travel lane and the bike lane. And this is what was selected. Uh, so the plans do now include this vertical bollard element. Um, and I'll point those out to you as we uh, move forward. Next slide, please. So keep in mind that north is to the left and uh, we'll be going in order of the numbers there, one through six, starting at one, and that's uh, West Third Street, working our way down to six, which is uh, Sebastopol Road. Um, and next slide, please. We'll start on the top layer. Um, okay, so this is the south of West Third Street. West Third's on the left. That's the Occidental Road, westbound uh, State Route 12 off-ramp. Next slide, please. And I'm going to walk you through some of the features of the plan, uh, pointing at uh, using these numbers as a guide. So starting at one, uh, you'll see a number of corners of the intersections are bright blue. Those are where we're uh, uh, proposing to extend those uh, corners, those uh, curb extensions for the purposes of both shortening crossing distance for pedestrians as well as to tighten some radiuses and to slow traffic, some traffic down as it travels through the intersection. Um, number two, uh, just above there, did want to point out that there is an existing right turn lane that overlaps with the bike lane. For, uh, in order to meet the, the volume and operations of this intersection, we do need to maintain the right turn lane and there is no extra room here to separate the two. So that's uh, gonna remain as it currently is. Number three, you'll see the dots on the plan. Those are the raised bollards. So every time you'll, you see those dots within the buffered area, uh, that is uh, those raised bollards. So when we, you get to driveways, you won't see them. So there's openings for vehicles. Uh, number four, just wanted to point out where we do have driveways, uh, the green bike lane is, is hashed or, or dash, hatched or dashed. Um, just the standard way of uh, notifying the driver that that's a conflict zone with uh, a bicyclist. Um, although not numbered, but above number four and to the right that you'll see that orange strip. Um, we're going as part of the plan uh, recommending that a uh, pathway be opened up to the uh, residential complex to the north. So those folks have easy access to the signalized crossing there at Oxenal Road. Uh, rather than having to walk all the way to third or um, walk across the street where there is no crosswalk. Moving on to number five, and you'll see two of them, um, just noting the, uh, the dash bike lanes through the intersection, where it would be marking those through the intersection for uh, awareness of the drivers where the cyclist is. Number six, the stop bar for that northbound traffic, or in this case, uh, from right to left, uh, we've moved that up. Uh, it's now sits further back, move it up to um, kind of strengthen the intersection a bit. Number seven on the top right, that's the uh, pedestrian crosswalk on the on-ramp. And that's where we're showing a raised uh, crossing, uh, a, a slight speed hump for vehicles as they travel over it, um, beneficial to the pedestrians. And number eight, an important curb extension and that we uh, would really channelize that traffic that's uh, traveling south on Stony Point and turning uh, right on the uh, Highway 12 freeway. And this really designates a specific place where they start to merge over and where they uh, cross the path of the um, cyclists. Next slide, please. we're going to have a poll question now. So Steve Brown, are you going to go with the poll question? I'll go ahead and read that. Uh, if those of you participating, just a quick poll question to improve pedestrian crossings at the Highway 12 westbound on ramps, the use of crosswalks, um, of, that should say use of raised crosswalks or flashing beacons have been proposed, indicate which you prefer. So a raised crossing, like a, a slight speed hump for vehicles or no raised crossing, but with flashing beacons that uh, the pedestrian would activate. If you can go ahead and make your selection now.
Okay, Steve, can you reveal the results? I can. Uh, so for the uh, raised crosswalks, 57% uh, of our attendees tonight uh, prefer that. And for the flashing beacons, 43% uh, of our attendees preferred that. Great. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, moving on, I'm actually gonna show you a 3D view of this uh, section of Stony Point with the plan, both uh, under existing and with the plan. So if you imagine sort of a bird's eye view from uh, that location, uh, looking towards the south, uh, that's where the view will be uh, from. Next slide, please. So this is the existing view looking southbound on Stony Point Road. And Steve's going to toggle back and forth between uh, existing and, oh, let's go back one, back. If you can hold there for a second. So this is the existing facilities. And in the upper right, you see that uh, the right turn uh, onto the freeway and all the pavement that we're trying to minimize. So next slide, please. And if you hold there a minute. Um, where you see white curbs against the gray, that's our curb extensions, that same blue area we know, uh, show in the plan. You see the raised crossings on both loop ramps in this case, on the, on the top left and top right. And you'll see those ba raised bollards shown in yellow in this case um, uh, on sections of the, the bike lane. Uh, the um, northbound lane, again, stop bars moved up to shrink the intersection. Um, and I think that's uh, all the features of this location. Next slide, please. Okay, moving over to the Highway 12 bridge. Next slide for our numbers. Okay, walking you through the features of the Highway 12 bridge section. Number uh, starting on the left with number nine, both sides again, where um, the Openings to those uh, ramps are, uh, we have the dash bike lane to notify uh, the driver where the uh, cyclist uh, would be traveling through. Number 10 on the bottom left, again, that, that race crossing we just saw in the 3D view. Number 11, I'm showing both sides of the highway just, just to really highlight uh, the bollards that are in the buffered area between the travel lane and the bike lane on the entire uh, bridge section. Number 12, uh, as with before, you, you, we have added an additional southbound left turn lane. Um, this due to the, the high demand for this movement and the queuing that occurs with this left turn. And actually now with the double left turn, um, we are able to move a lot more traffic through the intersection with less uh, green time of the signal. So we can really use that green time more towards uh, crossings of the Joe Rodoto Trail. Number 13, again, with that stop bar, we've kind of pushed south uh, closer to the intersection to shrink that intersection a bit. Number 14, and if you go to the next slide, please. Um, okay, that's the Joe Rodota Trail um, path marked in yellow. And just want to point out some features of the intersection. Um, we have made some changes from before. We uh, up at A, um, you see the uh, the bike lane markings through the intersection as before. Num where C is shown, we have a cross bike marking parallel to the pedestrian crosswalk for the Jover tra Trail bike users. Up at B, and we're really pointing out that the uh, the Pork Chop Island the, for that free right turn has gone away, we've extended the curb, so it will be uh, a standard right turn maneuver at this intersection. This is really gonna benefit those uh, those trail users as they cross the intersection. Um, and a D, just wanted to also point out the, the all every corner is getting uh, reworked uh, and reshaped to uh, um, slow down traffic benefit the, those crossing either pedestrians or cyclists. Um, 
but I did want to point out the no right turn on red. You see right turn on red signs, and the way this uh, this concept design is, there there not won't actually be signs that are in enforcement enforced 24 hours a day. They would be uh, worked into the traffic signal, um, or, or no right turn on red arrow would come up when there are pedestrians crossing in that C location. Um, that's both coming off the freeway, making a right turn to go south on Stony Point, and those coming north on Stony Point, when there's pedestrians or bikes crossing, there'd be a no right turn on red signal, and traffic would have to stop until that traffic clears before they can, and then that light would go off, and then they can make their right turn onto the freeway. And because we are having the double left turn lane, we've really created a lot more green time for these other movements. So even though it may appear that we're um, taking away some capacity for that right turn, they actually get a lot more green time uh, under this design. Next slide, please. And why don't you go one more slide, please, Steve. I did want to, um, I'm sorry, Steve, can you go back one? Thanks. I just wanted to point out, I have number 15 on the right. That's just the crosshatch bike uh, um, lane as it crosses right turn lanes uh, that's on both sides of the street. Okay, now we'll go to the next slide. I did want to zoom in on our um, State Route 12 eastbound ramp intersection. So next slide, please. And we're showing that in comparison with the existing geometrics of the intersection. You see, we really tried to provide a more perpendicular standard crosswalk compared to what exists now. I'm a user of uh, this intersection, both as a driver and as a cyclist. And you know, the, uh, the maneuvering requirements for cyclists, especially crossing that right turn lane are very difficult. So it's now a standard perpendicular crossing with uh, um, no need to uh, do it in two stages. Um, and you'll see the, the, the bike crossing uh, here. And you also see the, the bollards in this case, those dotted lines are the race bollards uh, buffer area. You see that uh, pork chop island on the left going away um, in the scenario on the right. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so we're also gonna show you that area in a 3D view. Uh, this is the perspective. So from the center of the bridge, looking south as well. Next slide, please. Okay, this is existing. You see in orange, the Joe Rodota Trail is marked. Uh, that's the, you see the Pork Chop Island there. And Steve, next slide, please. And this is the that proposed design. So again, in white, you see the uh, added curbing. That island has gone away. Uh, in the foreground, you see the double right turn lane now. Um, and see if you want to go back once, just to go to existing, so folks can kind of see that change again. And hold for a sec, and forward again. So this is our proposed design for this really important crossing intersection of the Joe Trail um, in this project. Okay, next slide, please. We're gonna move on to the final section north of Sebastopol Road. Uh, next slide, please. And we'll start at 16 on the left. And that's just pointing out we have a right turn lane there that on the, on the last slide, I, on 15, I showed you the bike lane crossing that right turn lane with that standard crossover design. 17, um, just pointing out those dots are, represent those raised bollards. Uh, 18 on both sides of the street, that's our, we do have bus stops at this location. So we can't put the bollards and we dash the bike lane. So for the, for the buses to cross over and when they're making stops, and 19, next slide, please. I'm gonna zoom in and just show you that that right turn lane and the crossover of the bike lane currently exists now. Um, next slide, please. This is a view of the aerial view of uh, the right turn lane and we have another view, next slide. 
So there is some green dash markings out there today. We do have the right turn lane crossover. We need to keep this right turn lane in the design because of the, the high volume demand that we need to serve. Um, the difference though, you'll see in this view, there is no buffer between the bike lane and the travel lane. So now go back to the next slide, please. And as we return to that, you'll see in, uh, again on 19, we've, we have restructured the geometric. So we've squeezed out some space to put that buffer, that three foot buffer between the travel lane and the bike lane with those raised bollards. Moving on to 20 at the intersection, we have those bike maneuvers through the intersection marked uh, and one that's uh, in, in three directions. And uh, we're gonna finish with 21. We've shown this before, it's called a protected intersection. And next slide, please. Uh, we're gonna just show you an example of how that operates and we'll come back to the slide. So next slide, please. So here's an example of a protected intersection and some, uh, this one is in the city of Richmond. Next slide, please. We'll zoom in on that. Basically those red dotted, uh, those are raised islands and then the green paint is flush with the pavement. So there's areas where the pedestrians can cross but they are crossing the path um, in some cases of bicyclists. But as a bicyclist, you're, you come in to cross and you're protected by that uh, middle island from vehicles turning right. So a right turning vehicle has to turn around the outer edges of, the, of all those raised islands and everything inside is for the pedestrian and bicyclists to mix and, and cross. Next slide, please. Oh, we're gonna move on to our poll question too. So Steve, let's see what that is. All right. Oh, here's the results of our first uh, poll. Uh, Steve told 57% raised crossing 9%, uh, 43% flashing. So can we go on to the next question? All right, I'll go ahead and read that. A protected intersection, which I've just explained, has been proposed for the Stony Point Road Basketball Road intersection. What is your opinion of the proposed design rated on a scale of one to five with one indicating strong support and five indicating strongly oppose? If you can make a selection and we'll uh, wrap up our presentation. All right, if we can uh, close that out, Steve, and maybe show us the results. Okay, looks like we have about 48% strong support. Um, I would say this is uh, or about 81% in support or strong support of, of the protected intersection design. So thanks for that feedback. All right, let's move on to the next slide and I'm just be wrapping it up. Okay, um, I did wanna point out, I've been, we, you may have seen this orange line in the plan. Um, as Barry mentioned, we got feedback last presentation about the desire to have some alternative to using the bike lanes for those with uh, children riding to school. So we have made accommodations in the plan for a future phase um, of a two-way off street path. And that uh, would extend from the Joe Dota Trail shown on the top left to the Sebastopol Road intersection on the bottom right. And we've shown this in combination with the existing sidewalk. Our vision is that the existing five foot sidewalk would double in size to about 10 feet wide, sort of the standard dimensions for a multi-use path to make uh, this space both available for pedestrians and cyclists. 
Um, there is a, some design issues that, that we need to investigate further. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. There is the, just pointing out the orange line, which in combination with the sidewalk above it is our 10 foot two way path. Next slide, please. So this is the space that that um, two way path would be located. We'd actually create a buffer between the uh, essentially where the trees are would not be usable sidewalk, but we'd, we would take the rest of the sidewalk, expand it to get 10 feet. And you, you can see we likely have some retaining walls. There's an issue of where the property lines are. Next slide, please. We do have some utility boxes that we'd have to contend with in the design. So this is something as part of our final report, we're gonna cost out and potentially include in the plan as a future phase of the project. This would not uh, replace the bike lanes. The idea is to implement the changes to the bike lanes and the signal changes in the corridor. And this would be a, a second phase enhancement uh, for the project. Next slide, please. In fact, showing you the two-way path. All right. Next slide, please. So uh, that concludes our tour of our concept design. Um, this, I assume, will be on the city's website if you'd like to take a closer look um, at our work. And I want to uh, thank my staff who worked hard on this, Cameron, who's uh, nice on the call spent a good deal of time with a lot of these details. So thanks, Cameron. Next slide, please. So next steps. Uh, this is, as Barry mentioned, our second meeting. Um, there's gonna, uh, there is an online survey posted on the website. We hope you go on and fill that out. Um, we're gonna take questions in a second. So any of the questions from tonight and the survey results uh, we will bring to the uh, Bicycle and Pedestrian uh, Board for their consideration uh, on the 18th. And then we will work to finalize the design and the report um, in the month of May. Next slide, please. Okay, so that concludes our presentation. And uh, Steve, if you wouldn't mind going back two slides and we can leave the design up on the screen uh, where, while we take questions. So um, now's the time, I believe, I'm gonna pass it to Steve or Nancy to uh, uh, oversee the questions. Thanks, uh, Steve and Barry for sharing the update on the design concepts that you've um, revised based on all the feedback you've heard over the last uh, couple of months. So pre appreciate that and, and um, happy that you can share share that all, all that information with the participants um, this evening. So um, I, I guess at this point, uh, I'd like to um, you know begin uh, to hear from all the participants here um, at tonight's meeting. And this is your opportunity to um, express your, your concerns, your thoughts, your, have, list any questions that you have for Steve and his team. Um, as, as you could see from their schedule, they're, they're close to uh, buttoning up the, the study and uh, anticipate that to happen in May. So um, this is a, a good, good chance now for, for folks to weigh in. So. I will um, stop there and I will ask our, our host, Steve Brown, to um, kick off the question and answer period for, for all the participants. Thanks, Steve. All right, thank you, Nancy. So um, now that Nancy has called for the public questions and comments, um, I'm, I'm going to uh, explain how this uh, process uh, works. So for individuals wishing to participate in the meeting by telephone, of course, you could dial uh, star nine to raise your hand. Uh, I'm then going to start calling on the public one by one who have your Zoom hands raised. Uh, once I call on you, I'm going to un uh, unmute your microphone so that you can ask your question. And once you have raised your hand and asked your question, uh, shared your input, I will lower your hand and mute your microphone so that our panelists can respond. So I'm going to go ahead and 
and begin with uh, Ryan Goss. So Ryan, um, can you hear me? Are you able to speak to us? Ryan? Hello. Please go ahead. Yes, I have uh, quite a few concerns on this. I do live uh, behind FUMAX at Casa del Sol, so I'm in this intersection all the time at peak hours. Um, it doesn't seem like very much thought has gone into the safety of traffic. With quite a bit of thought on the safety of the pedestrians and the bike lanes, but some of the things that are really concerning to me, like for example, uh, your number two spot, which was the right turn onto West Third Street, that turn itself is already very tight to make it turn. And now you're crowding it with the bicycle lane. You can barely make that turn if there is a car par uh, getting ready to turn that's there. It's very, very tight. And it just became tighter. Um, if you go where number three and four were, on Sebastopol Road, which is kind of by the Olivers there, those driveways. Um, that area there needs to be cleaned up. Just the vision triangles coming out of that, those driveways are really bad. Uh, bushes are too high. Uh, there's actually a sign, I believe by Exchange Bank, that actually blocks you from seeing the sidewalk so you can't even see the pedestrians on the sidewalk. So that needs, that's one thing that should be addressed in addition to the work that you're doing. Um, also, number 12, which is the making the double turn lane going eastbound on 12. If you're, if you're on Stony Point Road turning, uh, turning right to go east on 12, it's already dangerous with one car coming, one turn lane coming in because they always swing wide right there. So now, now you just double it up and that's going to be extremely dangerous for drivers to turn right. Uh, then lastly, on number 19, where the, where you're turning left or sorry, excuse me, right onto Sebastopol road where the bollards kind of separate and you have that break there, those bollards in that area right there where it's kind of in the middle of the street, that is going, those bollards will be taken out. Uh, cars are gonna hit that. I mean, this, this is a very, to put it nicely, a very volatile area with people that just have no patience in this area as it is. Um, if you were to turn left onto Stony Point from Sebastopol Road, nine times out of 10, you're gonna get cut off from somebody trying to get on Highway 12 in that section. So we just crammed in and shortened up the driving lanes in an area where it's already like bumper cars as it is. I've literally seen a four wheel drive truck drive over the hood of a car because he didn't wanna get cut off. I mean, it's a really, really volatile, high temper driving area. And I know that's the purpose <coughs> of trying to protect the pedestrians and trying to protect the bicyclists. But I, I guarantee you're going to get a lot of, lot of, lot of really irate drivers, and you may save some lives on the pedestrian side, but you're going to have a lot of car accidents. That's about all I have to say. Thank you. So, so, so thank you, Ryan. I appreciate um, uh, you have a lot of um, well thought out um, concerns. So I, I think maybe if, if Steve Weinberger, if you wanted to make a stab at some of the, the suggestions or the concerns that you heard. Um, yeah. yeah, if I can go ahead and I'm not sure maybe Rob want, might want to follow me up, but I'll, I'll, I think I got all those. Appreciate the comments. Uh, just let's start with this. Design safety design for vehicles versus safety design for bicyclists and pedestrians. You know, in my experience, uh, the measures that we're taking for um, for pedestrians and bicyclists um, are going to also mean uh, safer driving conditions for drivers because we are 
we are bringing the the speeds down on the corridor slower speeds does translate to a, a safer roadway but that doesn't mean less capacity in fact we can get just as much or even higher capacity out of a lane that's slower versus a fast lane. And in fact, our, our, our signalized intersections, which really control the capacity of this corridor, um, our, our goal in this design was to maintain or uh, the current capacity. And, and actually that double right turn lane actually does a lot to help us improve the operations of the corridor. So. We, we have paid attention to the, the vehicle traffic. This is specifically our charge is, was to enhance ped and bikes. There is a side benefit uh, in that we're creating a slower corridor. Uh, we're, we're uh, you know, fr frankly, from my experience, a lot of collisions, safety issues are generated on corridors that have higher speeds and a lot of excess pavements. Those are two things we're trying to address bring speeds down, reduce that sort of the, the big unused pavement areas that sometimes um, drivers who are, aren't as attentive start using uh, in various ways and, and there's some confusion. So we're really trying to channelize that traffic. So we think we've done what we can uh, to really improve the vehicle safety aspects as well. Uh, you mentioned the right turn on the third that it actually is not getting tighter it's exactly what exists there today there's the island if you look on the top left that's the existing island down the street the lanes are the same we haven't made any changes well, well you know i'm discussed this with staff um we are our goal in this project was a striping project that uh, and changes to uh, curbs at, at intersections. Um, this is one where we didn't show any widening, but we'll, uh, we'll explore that with, with staff. Um, so thanks for that comment. Um, you mentioned brushes, uh, 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 brush that's blocking the view of drivers. Um, I, I think I know where, I'm, where you're talking about and and, and in the plan, we don't talk much about landscaping on this. We're just talking geometrics, but um, in the report, we will be talking about sort of existing versus any uh, added landscaping as, as part of the project. So we'll uh, take a look at that, thanks. Um, you mentioned the double left turn lane. I think you were talking about our uh, added double left turn to uh, turn left onto the highway and then how that traffic swings wide and interferes with traffic turning right. In this case, we're actually gonna, I think eliminate that problem because there will no longer be that free right turn lane where right turn now turning right on the freeway is occurring all the time at random. Now that traffic will stop at a red light. It'll get a green light to go. When it gets a green light, there is no left turning traffic. So we're really sort of, you know, managing that right and left turn traffic. So for most of the time, they're not occurring at the same time like they do now. Um, in terms of the bollards, um, and maybe Rob can address this. Uh, he, he did investigate the bollards and discuss with staff. My understanding of these bollards is, is they are, they can be um, knocked over and, and that's what we want them to be. We, we want them to be a visual impediment, but not to block emergency vehicles. Say if there's a, a ambulance coming through, traffic can go between if they knock one over, turning to the right in an emergency situation, uh, they can be just placed back back up, but they're, they're not solid and are not gonna uh, damage a, a vehicle. They may get knocked over once in a while to me, that's part of doing their job. Um, Rob, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I was just gonna, uh, thanks Steve. I was just gonna add that the, the bollards are plastic. They're anchored to the, um, the asphalt, but they, they do um, pop back up. They're, they're basically designed to be hit if they, um, and to, to rebound. I think what the um, gentleman was, was talking about was the the right turn down at Sebastopol and Stony Point 
and if that's okay. the area that he was discussing that um it would tend to be um driven over um i think that's i think that's the area he's talking about i just want to let him know that we did have w chance run uh traffic turning templates with large trucks to make sure that trucks can make those turns without um running over those corners uh to ensure that that that's actually a doable uh a makeable turn so thanks all right very good our uh our next uh uh, person with their hand up is Michael Lapelt. Michael, you should be able to ask your question at this point. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I really appreciated it. I know the complexities of uh, and the nuances of trying to do this. Uh, have a couple of things. Um, the crosswalk, the raised crosswalk. Um, is there any? I, I like that concept. Is is there any way that you could have a bump prior to that? I mean, particularly coming off uh, Stony Point Road on East 12, those cars coming around there come pretty rapidly. And I think they need a heads up before they get to the crosswalk. A race quash rock isn't going to stop anybody from running, running over a pedestrian if they're moving too fast. So. That's one thing. Can you have a bump prior to that or a combination of flash and uh, raised crosswalk? So that's my first question. Uh, the second one was around the barriers. And I think that was answered in terms of uh, being plastic. Um, and the final thing, uh, well, back on the comment on this, I think that your improvements are much needed. And I think that they're stellar and well thought out, but they're not going to incorporate all levels of cyclists. Uh, certainly not level one cyclists who are uh, meaning all ages and abilities. So that's why that phase two is really important. And that would really enhance increasing the bike culture because in the future, having a more bike friendly city is really key on many levels for health, greenhouse gases, um, so addressing that and dovetailed onto that when you, I know about future plans with the government, uh, that I could extend out over years. And, uh, if we want to encourage this by culture, I think we need to speed up that process to have that separated path. So you get more people out of their cars and into their bikes. So those are my comments. Uh, I'll conclude it there. So. Again, thank you very much for all the work you've done. Okay. I'll thank you, Michael. So I, I well, appreciate your, uh, again, thought out uh, questions and concerns. So I don't know, Steve, there might be a, a few things in there you, you want to try to tackle. Weinberger? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, address the, the question about the raised crosswalks and can we put a bump before the crosswalk? You know, first and foremost, I need to say this is a Caltrans facility. Um, and this is a concept design that the city will then move forward with. And uh, um, in fact, we've been having some discussions with Caltrans about the lane widths on the overcrossing since they will need to approve the plan, any plans for the ramp intersections and the overcrossing. Uh, we do have some narrow widths there that uh, Caltrans will be interested to discuss. Um, and as far as the, the ramp goes, that is a Caltrans facility, anything that's designed there, they need to approve, meet, needs to meet Caltrans standards. Um, we have seen them install um, a raised crosswalk like this on a ramp. There's one in Sonoma County in the town of Windsor at the downtown interchange, the northbound on-ramp. Um, was the, actually the first one in Caltrans, the Bay Area District, uh, where they did put a, a raised facility on a, on a, on ramp. Um, we we modeled it uh, after a lot of them that exist similar to this in in Boulder, Colorado. If you've been there around the uh, University of Colorado campus and the, their freeway entrances have the raised crossings, it's the standard design. And if you think about it, 
traffic needs to slow before it reaches the race part. So they're slowing before the crossing. Um, in, in a freeway on-ramp situation, that's, that's the standard that, that state agencies have used in uh, both in California and outside, but, um, but not sort of the uh, aggressive bumps before uh, and, and after. Um, but, but we'll look into that and see what else Caltrans has done because they, uh, uh, it's their facility and see what they're um, willing to do on the, on the ramp. But this is part of our recommendations. So, but we'll, we'll see if there's uh, been any other designs that use for ramps, thanks. Um, I think we answered your question about the bollards um, and uh, your last comment about the uh, the class uh, or the class one the the trail on the south end uh, you're you're absolutely right that is intended for the level one or less experienced cyclists um, and that is going to be that's a costly item on this project when if you see the terrain and what needs to be done but um, we're pursuing that as part of this plan okay thank you and our, our next uh, participant here uh, is spelled B-U-T-H, uh, Booth. Um, you should be able to uh, talk at this point. Yes, hello. Um, uh, I do have a question about the stretch between Stony Point Plaza and Sebastopol Road. So there is on uh, Stony Point Road northbound going into the intersection with Stony Point Plaza, there's like three car lanes, the rightmost of which serves actually as a right turn lane into that uh, gas station and shopping center there. And the bike lane is right between that lane and uh, the sidewalk there. So I've had a pretty bad bike accident there because a car swung right into me turning right as I was trying the, to cross the intersection on green. And I was wondering why the right turn lane there could not be separated from the, the lanes that are going straight. Like it is, for instance, on that same stretch on Stony Point Road going southbound into the intersection with uh, Sebastopol Road. That's Thank you, Booth. Um, is, that, is that your only question this evening? That's my question. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so thank, thank you. Appreciate that. So, uh, Steve Lamberger, would you like to uh, reply to that? And if Rob has anything to add. I'm not sure I got the, a clear picture of the, the, the right turn lane you were talking about. Um, maybe if, if Rob caught that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, so, uh, the reason that that's not a right turn only lane, I believe that's your question is why isn't the northbound, uh, curbside lane adjacent to the bike lane, a right turn only lane. Um, and if it was, then yes, the bike lane would be shifted to the other, the other side of that lane to avoid that right hook movement. This lane in this location actually serves as, um, not only a right turn into the, the plaza, but also um, the lane going through to the uh, to the current right turn that's the on-ramp um, onto eastbound um, Highway 12. So when we have a shared lane that's both a through and a right turn lane, we maintain the bike lane and that's the Caltrans standard as well. We maintain the bike lane to the right of the through right lane. Yeah, and why don't I add to that now? I um, you know the area you're talking about. If 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 that say were converted to a right turn only lane, the uh, the demand for right turns ahead to get, turn right on to the freeway, um, Rob just wants to make sure that you know that isn't you know give them continuous space. That sometimes that volume demand extends uh, past south of Stony Point Plaza. If that were a right turn only lane, then that right turn freeway traffic would need to be over. There'd be, then we'd have some congestion as it then needs to uh, merge to the right um, in the lane. So 
Um, but we will um, explore this issue as we finalize the plan. All right. Our next um, participant attendee is Tom Helm. Tom, you should be able to ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you for this uh, improving the safety of this area. Um, I think that's the, the most of, you got that right. Everything is safer. Uh, I have a point about turning right off Stony Point South onto Sebastopol Road, Sebastopol Road. If, a truck is going to have a hard time. I guess you said you've modeled it, but it seems pretty tight, 11 foot lane, and then the truck has to go out a long way before it can start turning right onto Sebastopol Road. Just that's an observation. And the last observation is on our poll number one, where the raised sidewalks came out somewhat ahead of the beacons for crosswalks. I, I think with this audience tonight, you got a pretty clear opinion about favoring the race crosswalks. But I think if you send that poll to the motoring public generally, you might get a different answer. And that's something that you'll have to consider at some point. So thanks again for improving the safety of this area. It's, it's been needed for a long time. Hey, thanks, Tom. I appreciate that. So, Steve, do you want to talk about his uh, first uh, point a little bit? <clears throat> uh, there was the issue about the <clears throat> right turn. Um, I mean, we have modeled the truck turning, uh, wheel tracking at that intersection, and um, we will circle back to that to um, make sure uh, we're um, meeting the, the design guidelines and the uh, city's happy with that. Since that's come up a, a few times, we'll definitely take a second look. Uh, regarding the poll, uh, by the way, this uh, the uh, a longer poll, including these same questions, uh, there'll be a survey monkey poll on the city's website with those same questions. So we're, uh, if you can notify your friends and neighbors that that's up there, we want to get as many responses as we can over the next week. Um, so we can get a bigger audience and response to those questions. So thanks. Okay, our next participant attendee is Richard Koch. Richard, um, you should be able to talk now. Yes, I just have uh, two um, questions. First of all, has uh, a dollar figure been put on all these uh, modifications? And secondly, and even more importantly, has a pedestrian bridge system been considered? That's it. Can, can I ask where, oh. you're, where you're asking about a pedestrian bridge system? Good. Instead of all of this modifications to, pre, to prevent uh, bicyclists and pedestrians from being run over by cars, uh, get them out of the way and uh, you wouldn't need all of this bollards and raised crosswalks, etc. Nancy, do you want me to go ahead? Yeah, I think I think was that clarification all right for you, Steve? Yes. Are you, are you, yeah. Okay. Good. So yeah, could you could you um, respond to his two questions? Yeah. Thanks. Um, so our um, our next step in this is to cost out the project. Um, uh, it's it, on the face of it, it is mostly uh, new striping. Uh, there there is some signal. Uh, um, changes, uh, signal equipment changes at some of the intersections. Um, and that will be uh, presented to uh, the BPAB at their, at their next meeting. Um, and in terms of the uh, pedestrian bridge issue, I, I, I think 
you know, in uh, this question to, over the years, it, it has come up on projects that we've worked on. Uh, typically, it might be more of a uh, single location uh, crossing a major street that that issue comes up on. In this, in this instance, we have so many points of uh, points where pedestrians are crossing, it's just not uh, financially practical to provide a bridge system. In fact, if you think about it, the, the really the only places in Sonoma County where there are pedestrian bridges is over 101 um, for the most part. And I'm sure I'm missing some, but uh, those are the most visible. And uh, the newest br uh, bridge under consideration is between uh, the JC and the west side, which will connect to this uh, smart station, a path to the smart station. And that's been in the planning stages for uh, my involvement has been over 10 years. It uh, seems to have funding now and it seems to be moving forward. But um, so that's the kind of locations that really it makes sense financially to start pursuing pedestrian bridges is when you have major uses like the JC to connect to the smart station. Um, you don't generally see them in um, situations like this. There are some instances around the Bay Area where like a regional tra trail, like in Walnut Creek, the Iron Horse Trail does uh, have a bridge over Ignacio Valley Road. That's a six lane arterial with 30,000 vehicles a day. Um, so that's, and that's a uh, higher, a high volume trail system crossing um, the highest volume arterial in Contra Costa County. Those are the type of locations that you see it. So in this location, um, we have so many points of pedestrian crossings, it's just not financially feasible to start looking at our bridge system. Okay, our next question comes from uh, our participant, uh, Jorge. Jorge, you should be able to just speak at this point. Great, thank you. Uh, so first off, thank you for the presentation. I've lived here in near this part of town for my entire life. And definitely the most dangerous section is coming off of eastbound 12 and going south on Stony Point Road. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, about a pedestrian, about a, a bridge system, but not, not for all the, the um, intersections, just specifically for the Joe Rodota Trail. Uh, it seems to me that that's where most accidents happen and I know, I know you kind of answered it, but that was answering it in, in terms of um, pedestrian bridges for the entire thing, but would it be feasible to put a pedestrian bridge just on the Joe Rodota Trail uh, to avoid some of, um, uh, just like the previous uh, commenter said, to, to get pedestrians and cyclists off the road? Because it, it is a pretty big road. There's a lot of trucks because of the two grocery stores to the, to the north and south of that intersection. So you get big rigs, you get construction cars, you get motorcycles, you get people uh, making the right-hand turn, and, and it is dangerous, and I think a pedestrian bridge there would, would help. Um, so that's my first question, and the second question is, um, given, given how, how slow things can move, is there any way that we can add the no turn on red immediately? Um, because people are still getting, you know, into minor accidents and sometimes major accidents because of that. Uh, turn on red. So I just wonder if that's something that the city could do quickly um, and put that up. So thank you. Those are my two questions. And I could clarify them if you need to. Oh, no, th thank you, Jorge. Um, so um, interesting thoughts. Uh, so Steve Weinberger, do you want to tackle um, some of um, Jorge's thoughts? Thanks. Yeah, I, I have a thought on the, the first question and just a warning to Rob. I'm going to pass both questions. Uh, I'd like to hear the city's perspective, staff's perspective on that. Um, but on the first one, I'll, I'll let Rob chime in about, you know, has the city ever considered a bridge? I just wanted to point out uh, as a consultant to the city that we're been asked to uh, help with the design of the uh, these intersections that they we've we've been paying a lot of attention to the Highway 12 uh, Joe Rodota Trail intersection, and uh, I can see by our uh, 
the time we spent on that showing the details that there is we have worked in a, a lot of changes that will be a significant benefit to cyclists and pedestrians uh, with the no right turn on red in both directions essentially as a cyclist or a pedestrian and and when you get a walk signal uh there you will not have any conflicts of right or left turning uh, our, our vehicles at all as you can give and you'll be given sufficient time in sort of a standard crosswalk situation so the the proposal is a, a significant enhancement to the safety of pedestrian bikes for this plan um but i'll let rob respond to the has the city considered a bridge there um and uh whether the city can immediately move forward with the no right turn on red. So Rob. Yeah, thanks Steve. Um, yeah, theoretically we, I mean, I've, and conceptually I've thought about a bridge going there and I would I would love for the, there to be a bridge there, but financially it's currently just not in the cards. And that's why we're moving as fast as we can forward with this, this project. And um, as Steve mentioned before, this is really a lot of striping work, which is, is doesn't usually take too much um, financial investment. The bollards will be some more investment and the concrete will be quite a bit of investment. So we have to be very careful in designing and placing that um, in, its, in its location because as you would suspect, concrete is not easy to move once it's down. Um, so, and then moving on to the uh, no right turn on red. So that is something we have uh, considered in the past and we could look at that again. Um, what we found when in our observations is is how the signal is currently operated and um, is the Jordan Trail crossing. It gets it currently gets a leading pedestrian interval, so it it actually releases the pedestrians across the signal prior to releasing the vehicles um, from uh, the eastbound off ramp. So um, so that helps get the the pedestrians established before they get the green. Um, having the no right turn on red would basically just prohibit them to turn, make that right turn during that five second interval that the pedestrian has, is establishing themselves. What we're, what we're looking at doing with this operation is what Steve was alluding to is actually having more of an exclusive ped phase and bike phase to cross. So during that time frame, there would be no other um, turning, there'd be no other movements that would be conflicting with that, that pedestrian or bike crossing. So it would, be, it would be much more um, beneficial to the bike and, and pet at that location. But we, we can relook at uh, the more immediate uh, right turn on red and go out and take, a, take another look at that. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Okay. So we are, we are um, back to uh, one of our uh, original uh, participants, Ryan Goss, uh, would like to ask a follow-up question. So, um, Ryan, you should be able to speak now. Hello. Yes. Hi. Yes. So, I want to follow up uh, one of the, uh, actually, two things. Uh, I believe Tom was mentioning about the turn radius on the. Um, uh, turning right onto Sebastopol Road. Uh, I think at it, looking at the picture that you have, at least those two, two front bollards by the crosswalk should probably be taken out because I've seen many times a semi truck turn there while I'm waiting to turn uh, left onto Stony Point. And I've had to see cars back up and get out of the way because the truck can't make it with the current conditions. I've seen that many, many times. So I definitely that turn radius needs to be looked at. And it might just be by, you know, taking those front two bollards out, which I don't think would harm anything with the pedestrians or bicyclists. Um, the next thing, and I'd like to work backwards on this, I believe Booth had mentioned about, you know, he hadn't uh, kind of got in a little accident there turning in by the Chevron station um, in that one stretch. The stretch between uh, the Highway 12 and Sebastopol Road, if you're heading, heading north on Stony Point, 
the problem is when people turn left from Stony from Sebastopol Road on the Stony Point, most people it's a mad dash to get into the far right lane to get onto the freeway Highway 12 East. And with that double turn lane on Sebastopol Road to turn, I think that's a problem. And I think what would happen if that, be, and I know this, a lot of people won't like it, if that was a single turn lane from Sebastopol Road, you would eliminate those people cutting each other off in that tight congested area because not only they're jockeying to cut you off as soon as they get on Stony Point, then they get to the intersection by the shopping center by the Chevron. And if they didn't cut you off by then, they're trying to cut you off again once they cross that intersection. I think if it was just one lane only on that turn, it would get rid of the people that just don't know how to drive because now they're forced into one line. I think that would help um, quite a bit of the, the commotion in this area. So just a suggestion there, maybe that could be looked at. Um, but to do that, the timing on the lights are definitely going to have to accommodate that. So that's all I have. Thank you. Th thanks again, uh, Ryan, for the follow-ups. So Steve Weinberger, do you want to respond to his um, additional uh, comments? Yeah, Ryan, Ryan thanks for the idea. Uh, I'm sure we're going to Mo that's not something that we have discussed uh, through this project. We're going to model that and see what happens. <laughs> uh, see how the intersection operates. Things we'll look, we generally look at is a change like that. How does that affect the overall operations of the intersection? And what does that do to our left turn queue? And, and is there geometrics on Sebastopol Road to accommodate that? So we'll test it out and discuss it with staff. So thanks for the idea. All right, that is the last of the uh, questions that we had with hands up. Um, there are a number of comments that were left in our, our Q&A box. So I would like to go ahead and read those um, um, into, um, into our meeting. Uh, first one is from Nick M. It says, thank you for your efforts to make this stretch of road viable for human powered travel. I appreciate your inclusion of the robust bollards and efforts to slow turning vehicle traffic. I will feel much safer riding this corridor and crossing on the Joe Redoto Trail at Stony Point Road now, especially when riding with my kids. So thank you. Uh, the next one is from, um, from Patricia Rayfield. She comments, uh, crossing Stony Point on the Joe Redoto Trail is a mess. It's an obstacle course. And when will this be cleaned up? So I don't know if you want to give a quick response to that. Um, let's see, Nancy or Rob, did you want to respond to the uh, the timing of implementation? I'll go ahead. And, so, yeah. Rob, go I ahead. don't know, Rob, you can go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know, as was mentioned before, the next step is going to our BPAB in uh, the middle of March to bring this um, plan to them to get their um, input on on the plan as well. Um, we do have some money, uh, I believe, planned for the next budget cycle. Our goal is to um, be able to compete for grants uh, for this, to input this, as well as um, to, to get more money in our CIP cycle the following year. So um, it's not gonna be overnight, it, it, but um, we're, we're doing our best to, to find funding sources for this project so that we can get it implemented. We, it's, it's the bike board's uh, number one project that they want us to focus on. And so this, this is where, we're, where we are putting our effort. All right, very good. And that, um, that is the end of the questions in the um, Q&A box. So um, I guess we can move on to uh, wrapping up uh, the question session or section, excuse me. So, 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 uh, thanks, Steve Brown. I appreciate that. And it looks like um, we've had a really good, um, again, good, good uh, participation uh, this evening, just uh, like we did um, in November. So I want to really thank all the um, the participants and all the 
the residents who came out tonight and the panelists and the host and the translator for, for making this, a, 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 I think, a pretty productive um, uh, community meeting again. And, um, you know, it's, it's always good to, to take the time to listen to, to all of our residents and, and get, get their input. Um, and as you can see, um, Steve's team's already implemented a lot of the ideas that came out in November, and I anticipate there may be some additional modifications. So um, I'm just going to remind you of a couple things. Um, we, we do have the, the online survey that Steve Weinberger mentioned. It's um, srcity.org corridor studies. So it's online now. The presentation that Steve um, and Barry uh, made this evening is also posted on our website. So um, that's, that's also um, available. And then the meeting recorded, um, the meeting was recorded this evening and that's um, also will be posted probably next week on, on the city's website. So, you know, check that out. Again, it's srcity.org uh, forward slash corridor studies. And I want to thank everyone tonight for, um, for their participation. And um, just a reminder that the Bike and Pedestrian Advisory Board meeting um, is coming up March 18th. So if you, you know, are dialed into the process, that will be the next conversation around, around this uh, quarter study. So thank you again and have a good evening.